Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Uh, my name is Don Wolfensberger, director of the Congress Project here, which is part of our U.S. Studies Division. And I'm also your co-host today, and we'll talk more about that in just a, a little bit. Um, for those of you who may have just come in, I ask a little bit earlier, please turn off your cell phones and Blackberries because they tend to interfere with our audio system and our webcast. And this is uh, being uh, webcast live. Uh, it will be uh, archived. For those of you who want to go back and watch it uh, next week, uh, it'll probably within a week or two it should be available in our archives. Uh, for those of you who are new to the center, let me just briefly explain what uh, we are about. Uh, the w Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars was created by an act of Congress back in 1968 as a living memorial to our 28th president. And one of the people that came up with the idea was Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was back then a, a staffer in the 60s in the, in the White House. But uh, the idea was, instead of another marble uh, statue or, or a mausoleum or something, that we should have a, uh, a living memorial to our 28th president. And Wilson, uh, Woodrow Wilson today remains the only president to hold a Ph.D. And he firmly believed in the idea of bringing together the, the scholars and the, the policy makers, the thinkers and the doers, uh, in an exchange of ideas and views on important uh, issues of the day, both domestic and international, and their historical context. And it was that, with that idea that the Woodrow Wilson Center was founded. We have about 700 meetings here a year, of which the Congress Project only does about a half dozen or so, so we're a very small part uh, of this center. But you're, you're part of one of those 700 meetings a year that we have where we bring together the public and uh, also the, the, the politicians, the, the statesmen, the executive branch folks, and so on to, to talk about important issues. The Congress Project Project, uh, which I had was founded uh, in June of 1999 with the same idea. In our seminars, we will usually have a member of Congress or two or some senior staff, a journalist and a scholar who does an original paper, and we'll mix it up on the, the policy process with respect to a particular issue and then um, open it up to the audience for questions. But the idea is to sort of highlight uh, how the policy process uh, really works on Capitol Hill. Uh, we are in the midst of a two-year series now that was sort of centered on the uh, 2008 presidential elections, uh, half of them leading up to the election and now the other half coming after the election, uh, on the theme of uh, Congress and the president, uh, policy, process, and governance. And uh, so today's uh, program sort of fits very nicely into that, as you can see from your, your handouts. The, the title for today's uh, program is make sure I get it right, the Congressional Black Caucus, the committee system, uh, and the president. And uh, we'll hear a lot more about that uh, in a little bit. But uh, I am very pleased to, to say that this is our second annual uh, meeting that we have co-sponsored with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Last year, many of you have, may have seen the program on the Martin Luther King holiday, how that came about with John Conyers, who uh, was the original sponsor of that legislation and pursued it for 16 years until it finally uh, was enacted. And so it was quite a, a story that he told, and we had a number of other uh, commentators on that. So it was a very exciting experience. So we're pleased, to, again, to co-sponsor this with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Um, I will just momentarily introduce the President and CEO, but just to explain our format, uh, after Elsie uh, Scott introduces uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee and, and she gives her talk and answers some questions, she will have to, to leave, but Elsie uh, uh, will uh, be uh, moderating that portion of the program and fielding uh, your questions, so wait for a microphone and give your name and affiliation so we get this all on our webcast. The second half of the program, I will help uh, moderate and introduce the other half of our panel which uh, I will do at that time and not uh, interrupt the flow now. Uh, the Congresswoman does have to leave a little around 4 o'clock. So uh, with that, I will turn things over to Dr. L.C. Scott, the President and CEO of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, to tell us a little bit about the foundation and introduce our distinguished keynote uh, speaker. L.C.? Thank you, Don. I am very happy to join you again. As Don mentioned last year, we had this uh, program around Martin Luther King's uh, birthday, and the topic last year was the making of the Martin Luther King holiday bill. And I must say that uh, we received so much positive feedback on that particular program as it was shown a number of times on C-SPAN. And uh, we were very pleased to partner with the center, and we're glad that you invited us back this year. As he mentioned, I'm the president and CEO of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, not to be confused with the Congressional Black Caucus. The Congressional Black Caucus Foundation is a nonprofit, nonpartisan 
organization that is engaged in education policy, education and policy analysis. We are looking at how do we promote the next generation of African American leaders, especially African American leaders in policy making positions and in the Congress. So we have been around since 1976. Not, we haven't been around quite as long as the Congressional Black Caucus, but we offer a number of scholarships, fellowships, and internships that uh, bring young people to Washington who might not have this experience, who might not be exposed to the Congress, and we're hoping that through the process of participating in our programs that they might be encouraged to pursue public service as a career. And we also are engaged in uh, policy discussions and forums that uh, we do not only in Washington but throughout the country. We are uh, another project, one of the projects that we are very pleased about is our voice project. And this is where we are creating an online digital library that captures the history of the Congressional Black Caucus. And you can uh, access it through www.avoiceonline.org. We have a tabletop outside, and we hope that after the session you will be able to visit it. We have several exhibits up now. One is the Martin Luther King uh, birthday bill, another one on voting rights, one on the CBC involvement in the uh, uh, dismantling of apartheid in South Africa. And uh, we recently introduced a new exhibit called uh, Looking at the Environment, the CBC's Involvement Environment. And the year before, we rolled out an exhibit on the women of the CBC. So each year, we try to roll out at least one exhibit. So this is a dynamic, uh, dynamic exhibit that uh, is exposing the world to the work of the Congressional Black Caucus. As I think many times you only hear about the Congressional Black Caucus when there's a dispute or some controversy, and you don't hear enough about what the members are doing on a day-to-day -day basis to address the critical issues that are facing not just African Americans, but uh, all Americans, and especially those who are uh, poor and disadvantaged. I am very pleased to have joining me today the new chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. Last week we had the uh, swearing-in ceremony where we brought in the new Congressional Black Caucus chair, and she also serves on the board of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Congresswoman Barbara Lee represents the 9th District of California. This is Northern California. This is Oakland, Berkeley area. As the uh, as the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, she will serve a two-year term at which she will provide leadership to the 41 members of the Congressional Black Caucus, which advocates for uh, issues around issues and concerns that affect not just African Americans, but also the global black community. They were founded in 1971, and uh, she may want to talk more about the uh, history of the Congressional Black Caucus. But it was founded in order to maximize the African-American voice in Congress. At the time, we had very few African-Americans, and there was a need to how do we come together to show, so, uh, show force so that we can address some of the particular issues. And also, there were a lot of African-Americans in this country who did not have representation or did not have representatives that spoke to their needs and concerns. So the Congressional Black Caucus was represented, representing even people who did not live in congressional districts that were represented by black members. Congresswoman Lee was elected to Congress in 1998. She formerly served as a staff member on the staff of Congressman Ron Dellums, who uh, she says is one of her mentors. She sits on the powerful House Appropriations Committee. She's also vice chair of the Legislative Branch Subcommittee. She's very active with the Progressive Caucus, and I think she's a founding member of the Out of Poverty Caucus, and a senior Democratic Whip Chair of the CBC Task Force on HIV and AIDS. Uh, many of you know Congresswoman Lee from when she stood alone, stood alone in Congress uh, to challenge the rush to war in this country. And as a result, 
You know, she experienced a lot of death threats and other things. So it takes a lot. You know, when you're in Congress, there's always the pressure to compromise and to to get the vote passed. But this was one thing that she felt it was important enough that even though nobody else in Congress stood with her, she stood there alone. She has been very active with uh, the Darfur divestment bill. She sponsored, she was one of the sponsors of the bill that was able to get Nelson Mandela off the terrorist list. Most of you didn't know that when we went to South Africa together in 07, we found out at that time that Nelson Mandela was still on the terrorist list from his years with the ANC, when ANC was listed as a terrorist organization. And once she found out about it, she immediately got on her Blackberry and started saying, we got to do something about this. And so she made it her mission to say that we will get him off the list before his birthday, and uh, his 90th birthday. And she was successful at doing that. And so I, don't, I won't go on because you want to hear from her, but I just want to say that I'm very pleased to introduce a woman who is a champion, who's not afraid to take a stand, who's very active on a lot of the causes for the people who are least represented in this country, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Good afternoon. Uh, first, thank you, Dr. Scott, for that very uh, gracious and warm introduction. Also, thank you for your leadership uh, with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation because it, it truly um, is a foundation whose time has come, and the phenomenal work that you have done really has prepared it for now uh, this time uh, in terms of preparing uh, our emerging leaders and all of the, the policy and research work that uh, the foundation conducts. It's because of your leadership that we really have a foundation that we're very, very proud of. Let me also thank all of our distinguished panelists for uh, being here today and, and for Don for really uh, such a marvelous uh, idea uh, that you uh, are bringing to fr fruition here. Uh, this is really a very important time to have this discussion, and so I really do appreciate your vision uh, and inviting me to participate with you. This, um, I, uh, as Dr. Scott said, I previously worked for uh, Congressman Dellums, now Mayor Dellums of Oakland, and so I was here when the Congressional Black Caucus uh, was in its early um, days. Uh, probably, let's see, I was here as an intern, actually, during 1973, working uh, for Ron as a Cal in the Capitol intern. I returned <laughs> during Watergate. I returned to uh, California and then came back in 1975. And I had actually got involved in politics um, through a great woman, the first African-American woman elected to Congress, Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm. She convinced me that um, if I wanted to make the types of changes and if I wanted to shake things up and if I were a true uh, advocate for a people, then I would register to vote <laughs> and get involved in politics. And so it was Shirley Chisholm that really uh, got me involved uh, in politics, and to her and to Ron, uh, and to Reverend Jackson, who I worked with with the Rainbow Coalition. I give them uh, a lot of credit, a lot of honor for, at least on a personal level, for helping me uh, get to where I am today. It's been uh, 40 years since the formation of the CBC. In January of 69, uh, newly elected African American representatives of this was the 77th Congress uh, joined six incumbents uh, to form the Democratic Select Committee. The committee was renamed the Congressional uh, Black Caucus, and so the CBC was born in 1971. And uh, in preparing for uh, my swearing in, I went back and I looked at the goals of the CBC uh, 40 years ago. Uh, and the goals set by the founders were very simple, yet they were very, very profound and still very relevant for today. They were, and I quote, to positively influence the course of events pertinent to African Americans and others of similar experience and situation, and to achieve greater equity for persons of African descent in the design and content of domestic and international programs and services. Forty years later now, the Congressional Black Caucus remains just as necessary and as relevant as we head now into the 111th Congress. The CBC has always uh, led the Congress on each and every issue with intelligence, with commitment, and with power. 
and continues to be uh, the conscience of the Congress and the voice of the voiceless. I'm reminded of what Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm said 40 years ago. She said, the hour has come in America that all of us in this room can no longer be the passive recipients of whatever the politics of a nation may decree for us as citizens within this realm. But if we have the courage of our convictions, if we desire to make a contribution to make this nation, to bring about the fulfillment of the American dream so that it is meaningful for every segment in America, we will forget what the world will say whether we were in our place or out of our place. So this has and continues to be the mantra of the, the CBC. The Congressional Black Caucus, um, like the entire country and the world, we face now the dawning of a new day. And so as a body, we are at a point where we must examine and re-examine our mission and our history of advocacy and retool and rework for uh, it's an ever-changing and ever-evolving and very dynamic world. Uh, more importantly, we must also now figure out how we actively engage our constituency moving forward because we know now, thanks to President-elect uh, Barack Obama, there are huge numbers of people, millions of people, especially young people, uh, throughout the country who are going to demand, rightfully so, to continue to be part of this uh, democratic process. And so very uh, soon we will witness uh, history with the swearing in of a former member of the Congressional Black Caucus, one who inspired the country uh, to believe that we can uh, change course, uh, confront crises, and uh, he's a great patriot who will be the 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama. Uh, this is a particularly proud moment, uh, and it's a very inspiring moment for all of us. Uh, for the CBC, an Obama presidency represents a unique opportunity for us to enact legislation that will help fill what we call these moral gaps in our society. As we move forward in our work, uh, the CBC must heed the words of uh, Dr. King when he said, uh, you know, part of our role as African Americans and as people of conscience is to save the soul of America. Uh, and continue to be that conscience of the Congress by giving, again, voice to the voiceless and hope for the hopeless. We have to recognize and continue to recognize the dignity of all human beings, uh, and we have to be bold uh, in moving forward an agenda to tackle many of these issues which reflect these basic moral gaps in our public policy. Issues such as the foreclosure crisis that's shattering the lives of millions, providing for an affordable and accessible health care system for all, recognizing the huge disparities in the African-American community and communities of color as we move forward to develop this health care reform initiative, investing in public education so we can crack this uh, pipeline uh, to prison. Uh, we've got to create jobs uh, for people who historically may not have had an opportunity to get a job. Uh, there are millions of people who haven't been uh, laid off because they never really had a full-time job. Uh, energy independence, and we also have to begin to confront poverty uh, head on. The debate oftentimes, rightfully so, is, is about the middle class and what middle income people uh, need and, and, and must have in terms of our public policy, but oftentimes the poor uh, are not addressed in, in this debate. And so the Congressional Black Caucus is committed to moving forward to really make sure that this debate around the economic stimulus is inclusive. And of course we have many uh, individuals who are foreign policy experts. Uh, I served on the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, for eight years. Now I'm on the subcommittee uh, on foreign ops of the Appropriations Committee. And seeking uh, global security and peace. Uh, has always been part of the agenda of the Congressional Black Caucus in our foreign policy. So the question now is uh, how will the CBC go about uh, filling these uh, moral gaps? Uh, as the conscience of the Congress, we have to press for uh, moral equality. That's equal protection and equal empowerment for all people. Uh, as a caucus, uh, you know, we look to the past and we look to the vision of those 13 members of the CBC and we adapt that vision to the issues and to the problems which we're facing today. So the first way to address these issues uh, is through continued and committed leadership. For the past 40 years, uh, members of the CBC have worked diligently to make inroads into key committees and leadership positions in Congress. In the beginning, uh, leaders in Congress would often try to uh, marginalize our members. I remember when uh, my former boss, Ron Dellums, was uh, appointed to the Armed Services Committee. 
uh, he and Congresswoman Pat Schroeder had to share a seat because he was not allowed uh, his own seat there. There, so we've had many, 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 many uh, barriers to to shatter in the House of Representatives. Uh, we've had to fight to put our members on committees where um, they thought that we would have, where they thought we would have no influence. Some of you may remember when uh, Representative Chisholm was placed on the Ag Committee. Uh, she uh, rebelled against that. Uh, she said that there's very little agriculture in Brooklyn. <laughs> but even with this committee assignment, Representative Chisholm used her platform on that committee to advocate for food stamps and for other urban uh, issues relating to um, food security. And she later was placed on the uh, much prized Education and Labor Committee, and she was the third highest ranking member of this committee when she retired from Congress. Today we are seeing more CBC members in positions of power than ever. There currently are 41 members of the Congressional Black Caucus. With these uh, 41, we have powerful and dedicated leaders, such as our Majority Whip, Congressman uh, James Clyburn. He has given the CBC a window into the workings of leadership and has been essential in helping us pass key legislation that's important to our constituency. We have four standing committee chair persons. The dean of our caucus, Representative John Conyers, leads the Judiciary Committee. His committee has dealt with a variety of issues, including voting rights and voting reform and foreign intelligence and civil rights. During the last Congress, he and Danny Davis and the late, um, our sister, Stephanie Tubbs Jones, worked to pass the Second Chance Act, which was a groundbreaking piece of legislation that allocates $360 million toward a variety of reentry programs. The passage of this legislation is very important <coughs> for the African American community as it will help reduce recidivism and crack this pipeline uh, to prison. During this next Congress, this committee will, this Congress uh, has a responsibility to also now help address this foreclosure crisis. And I mean, not tinker around with it, but help deal with it in a big way. Some of us are calling for bankruptcy reform. Uh, we are also calling some of us for uh, foreclosure on, uh, I mean, a moratorium on foreclosures for a period of time. Representative Charles Rangel chairs the Powerful Ways and Means Committee, which controls tax and trade. His committee will be intricate in helping Congress and the President strengthen our failing economy. Chairman Benny Thompson will once again lead the Homeland Security Committee, which has and continues to play a crucial role in the security of this country following the horrific 9-11 terrorist attacks, as well as recovery efforts following the devastating hurricane in the Gulf Coast, hurricanes in the Gulf Coast. And our newest chair from the Congressional Black Caucus uh, is Ed Towns from New York, who will be uh, leading the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, which will be necessary uh, to ensure government accountability, which uh, is something that uh, we all have been um, pushing for for many years. Additionally, we will have uh, 15 subcommittee chairs and five CBC members serving on the Appropriations Committee. Secondly, we must work to increase diversity in Congress. There is no doubt that the amount of leadership currently within the Congressional Black Caucus is unprecedented. But we understand that uh, to whom much is given, of course, much is required. And so we clearly understand that we must leverage this power so that we can ensure that we bring about increased diversity within the Congress. There's also a concerted effort to increase diversity within the legislatures of our states and cities. We've seen much progress in recent years, like the recent election of two uh, black leaders in the legislature of Colorado. Uh, but there's still much work to do. Following the election of uh, Mr. Obama, we understand that uh, African Americans are now much more engaged in the political process, and so it's up uh, to us, the CBC, to ensure that African Americans and all people of color have those opportunities to run for public office. Third, we must learn how to effectively uh, communicate our message. Uh, Barack Obama was able to engage uh, the people of this country in a way that we have never seen before. His me message particularly resonated with young people. Much of this was largely due to his use of the new media, uh, such as blogging and e-newsletters, and his utilization of online uh, communities like Facebook and Twitter. 
To ensure that our message is resonating within our constituency, we must adopt some of these same methods. Additionally, we uh, have to continue to work with, and we have been for many years, um, with the Hip Hop Caucus and other programs that are engaging uh, young people. Programs such as the uh, such as CORE and SNCC and the Black Panther Party and all of our civil rights groups played an important role in the civil rights movement. And now we have to understand that um, our young people will lead us in the next century. And so we have to begin to understand their language, to speak their language, not in a condescending way, but in a way that lets them know that we value their thoughts and their opinions. The CBC, uh, we just met last Friday to lay out some of our goals for the 111th Congress. Included in those, of course, was economic empowerment. Times are tough, and people need jobs. More importantly, uh, in many of our communities, uh, job training, workforce development is key to help prepare for these jobs and the jobs of the future, especially uh, when you look at the green jobs industry. Uh, as we prepare to work with President Obama to enact a robust economic recovery package or an economic stimulus package, we want to make sure that we're investing in mechanisms that will provide for job training, but also that will give people skill sets that will help them become employed for years to come. We also must focus on health and wellness. The disparities in the black community are staggering. Staggering. It's really very apparent when we talk about health care. We live in a country where many Americans um, are one health care catastrophe from bankruptcy. The United States is one of only uh, two industrialized nations that does not offer universal government-sponsored health care. There are more than 45 million Americans without health insurance. More than 9 million of them are children. Of the uninsured, 56 percent are low income, and although people of color make up approximately 34 percent of the population, they comprise over half of the nation's uninsured. A large part of the health care crisis, of course, has to do with the HIV-AIDS epidemic. An estimated one million people are currently living with HIV in the United States, with approximately 56,300 new infections occurring each year. 70% of these new infections occur in men and 30% occur in women. African Americans make up only 13% of our population, yet now account for 54%, 54% of all AIDS cases in the United States. Additionally, 64% of the new infections in women occur in African American women. That's 64% of new infections the fastest growing segment of the population infected by this deadly disease. So it's time that we make high quality health care accessible for all. The CBC plans to be at the forefront of this fight and we have called for the development of a national AIDS strategy and a national AIDS plan which I'm very proud to say that on uh, World AIDS Day, December 1st, President Obama uh, stated very clearly uh, that he supports this and intends to work on this with us. Lastly, we want to strengthen our families. All of the aforementioned issues really do tie into this one overarching issue. If we don't have strong families, uh, we don't have strong communities. If we don't have strong communities, we don't have a strong country. And if we don't have a strong country, we will not have a strong global community. So these are just a few of the CBC's goals for the 111th Congress, but these issues will lay the groundwork for all of the other work that we do over the next two years. So as I conclude, I thought, uh, because I, since I have to leave a little early, I would um, answer some of, a couple of the questions posed uh, by Don uh, in his essay, The Growth and Role of the Informal Member of Congress. First of all, will success spoil the CBC? And I have to say, absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. The success of the CBC and the ascension of President-elect Barack Obama to the presidency will only strengthen our resolve to fight for justice and equality and continue to ask those hard questions and raise those issues that we have always been willing to ask and raise. Uh, next question was, will we be co-opted by the new president? Understand that we are without question ready and willing and intend to work with President-elect Obama. But we also understand that as President of the United States, Senator Obama is the President of the United States. And so the CBC has to be true to its mission to be the conscience of the Congress, as we said earlier, and again, going back to the Founders' uh, goals to positively influence the course of events, 
pertinent to African Americans and others of similar experience and situation, and to achieve greater equity for persons of African descent in the design and content of domestic and international programs and services. Yes, we have a shared experience with President Obama, but the CBC has to continue to work as we have been in the past on all of those issues that have been historically issues that were very important as our role as the conscience of the Congress. And we will work with the President-elect on our common agenda. We know that our agenda is uh, his agenda, and so we look forward to that. The third, the last question was, will it even feel, will it even feel a need to formulate and present its alternative congressional budget resolution? You know, every year we have, led by Congressman Bobby Scott, an alternative budget, which really, uh, you know, budgets are moral documents. They reflect the values of, of our country and, and what we believe where our resources should go in terms of our priorities. So we'll have to see the President's uh, proposed budget. Uh, and we uh, will have to say that uh, we'll we may put forth an alternative budget. We don't know yet. Um, we have to talk about that within our own uh, CBC. But we can uh, always, you should always know that we uh, will continue to make sure that our budget resources are uh, allocated properly and that our priorities of the CBC, creating jobs, job training, economic empowerment, health care, education, uh, reentry, all of those initiatives that I've talked about and more climate, addressing climate chain, change, uh, environmental uh, injustice, all of those issues have to be addressed with in the context of a budget. A budget is a moral document, and that is how we, we view the budget and how we will be proceeding. So thank you again, Don, very much. It's very good to see everybody here, and I want to thank all of the panelists and congratulate you. And uh, I just have to think about, make reference to George Daly. We've known each other since um, I was a staff person with Ron Dellums and Dr. Scott, too. So it's really a remarkable moment for me personally to have such phenomenal people who I've known for so many years working in concert with the Congressional Black Caucus to achieve uh, the goals of the CBC, which, of course, are goals that speak to the, to the soul of America. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congresswoman Lee, and uh, as she has left plenty of time for discussion with you, so I hope you will take advantage of her while she's here. Who has, who's taking the mics around? Uh, do we have a walk around? Okay, we need you to proceed to a mic. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joe Freeman. I'm a senior scholar here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And I was wondering if you could give us a little background into the role of the CBC in changing Harry Reid's mind about sitting Roland Burris. Is her mic on? Is the mic on here? Yes, Well, of course, we, um, our first meeting, this was on the agenda of my first meeting as chair. <laughs> and uh, we had a very healthy discussion with regard to uh, all of the issues uh, with regard to Mr. Reed, And we unanimously concluded that based on the legal arguments alone, the merits of, of his case, that there was no reason why he should not be seated. And the CBC voted uh, to, uh, and we did write to uh, Senator uh, Reed to uh, communicate our, our position on that. In terms of, oh, well, we don't know how that played into the entire uh, strategy with uh, Mr. Reed, but we do know we communicated this last Wednesday, and subsequent events will kind of show how all of that fit in. <laughs> but we were, I was very proud that we did come out uh, unified on that as, a, as speaking with one voice as our first act. Can we get a question? Uh, Mike, to the gentleman in the back. Hello, Representative. My name is Hector with the Executive Intelligence Review. Um, my concern was more in respects to, um, well, question towards the incoming administration being Barack Obama. And I find it important that he, that a huge mess not be left sitting on the table when he comes into the Oval Office 
And what I'm specifically referencing is the current conflict between Israel and Gaza. And it's to my understanding from uh, over the weekend that the vice president, the current vice president, does endorse that type of action. And to my understanding, is as long as he is in there up to the twentieth, very likely intends to promote. And I'm not too sure exactly whether it means backing financially, militarily, or simply verbally, but for even an attack of Israel into Lebanon. And so, in light of that, would the Congressional Black Caucus ensure that the vice president remain checked? And not to leave this mess into the incoming administration's lap. Well, I think the um, president-elect has said over and over again, "There's um, only one president at a time," uh, and I think he stated very clearly that he intends to actively uh, engage in uh, the peace process once he is a, uh, sworn in, which I'm very pleased to hear. Uh, and, in fact, we uh, have many members of our Congressional Black Caucus on the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, and we will be working with the President-elect to try to make sure that uh, somehow uh, we position the United States once again as the honest broker in trying to make sure that uh, the peace process is put back on the table as a priority in our foreign policy. Lady here in the red. Thank you. My name is Mary Olofuyeku, and I have a concern. I'm wondering if the caucus, Congressional Black Caucus, is concerned, uh, and it's it's regarding the uh, foodstuffs and things that come out of China, and uh, how they affect the health of our citizens, as well as I understand the Chinese have an automobile that they're uh, putting on the market, and I'm wondering um, whether or not that. Uh, automobile is going to be allowed to come in here, or whether or not there's going to be anything thrown up as a roadblock block to that. Thank you. Sure. The Congressional Black Caucus, absolutely, on food s safety, on the uh, the lead content of, of toys. Uh, I think during the last session, you saw Congressman Bobby Rush and others really take the lead on, on that in the Congressional Black Caucus, and we have our appropriate committee members who do take the lead on all of these issues, and it is a priority for us. Thank you very much for your service and your courage, um, Con Congresswoman. I'm Juanita Lott, and I'm from the, S the San Francisco Bay Area. I also came to Washington, D.C. in 1973. I'd like to know what you might want to give to the nation that, <laughs> I hate being a California chauvinist, but the kind of people's mayor, you know, that Willie Brown and that whole crew going back to Phil Burton. The legacy, you know, when we talk about the young people, we're mentoring them, that there was greatness. We've done this. We've risen. And so the lessons, particularly at the grassroots level, you know, from the folks in the Bay Area that can tr come to Washington, D.C., which is a community. I mean, there's a lot of grassroots and blue-collar, um, working-class folks who do the right thing every day. Well, I'm very proud to, to be from the Bay Area because this area in our country has been really a center for democratic movements. Uh, I go home almost every weekend. Yeah, my district is very active. I hear from people on each and every issue. Uh, cutting edge uh, thought, political thought. And I think what's important is that uh, people look at the Bay Area in terms of how we have somehow stayed engaged in the political process because I had, there's no way I could have been elected had it not been for grassroots efforts. Uh, coalition politics. Uh, I always remind uh, my colleagues that uh, Ron Dellums is like the father of coalition politics. Uh, we learned early on that we are all in this boat together and we have to form these coalitions of conscience to be able to elect individuals who will carry forth uh, a people's agenda. And so the Bay Area is, is an area that uh, I hope will get more recognition uh, in terms of its uh, ability to push the envelope and, and make uh, their elected officials, and, and believe me, they hold us all very much accountable. It's not only election to election, it's in between elections. We are held accountable. Our feet 
uh, they're, they're held to the fire each, each and everything every day. And I think that's part of the activism and the beauty of the activism is that it's not just we elect a candidate and then they go do their thing, but it's in the Bay Area they elect me and they want to know what I'm doing, what I'm hearing, how I'm doing it, and am I incorporating their views and ideas into my agenda. Uh, thank you for coming this afternoon. Uh, I'm Tony Miles and I'm a health and aging policy fellow uh, working this year on health care reform and I just wanted to hear a little more detail from you. Uh, there are a couple of models out there for health care reform. Max Baucus has a white paper. Uh, Barack Obama has one on change.gov. Um, can you t articulate a little bit about what the CBC would like to see in that process? Sure. Our, uh, we have a, a bill which uh, our second vice chair, uh, Congresswoman um, Donna Christensen from the Virgin Islands, has been uh, writing and promoting along with, we have a tri-caucus, the Hispanic Caucus and the Asian Pacific American Caucus. So the Black Caucus, Tri-Caucus, Asian Pacific American Caucus have been working for years on our health disparities bill. And that is central in the health care debate, or will be central, and we're about ready to reintroduce it. And that is about looking at the health disparities in communities of color and, and determining funding and strategies to close these, these huge gaps. Uh, one of the areas has to do with uh, workforce development uh, and the dearth of uh, people of color uh, in terms of the nursing fields and in terms of health care workers. And so it's a comprehensive bill. I don't know if we have a bill number yet, but I hope that you all, if you're interested in health care and the CBC, look at what we're doing to try to begin to close these gaps because what, what we don't want to happen is health care reform take place or the debate take place without the uh, – focus uh, of that debate or part of the focus on health disparities in communities of color. I'm, I'm Karen Miller with American Urban Radio Networks. I'm the Capitol Hill reporter. Two questions. Number one is, uh, there's such a high expectation of Barack Obama coming into, um, coming into the presidency He's promised a lot of things. Any thoughts that you have in terms of if just the expectation will be reached um, with, you, with all the expectation that's out there of, you know, Barack Obama is going to come in and change everything. And then the number two question is, um, one of the criticisms that people have said about the Congressional Black Caucus is sometimes people feel like, um, it's somewhat of kind of an old school, uh, you know, the focus on civil rights, um, and Barack Obama is kind of a new school, um, focusing on economic rights, inclusion, that type of thing. Could you um, just give any thoughts that you you feel on um, just the two of those coming together and what that might look like? I think the, that's the beauty of the Congressional Black Caucus. Those two have to come together. You know, our theme has been. Um, change course, confront crises, continue the legacy. As I mentioned earlier, we have four key, very powerful committee chairs, 15 very powerful subcommittee chairs. We have uh, many younger members now who have joined the caucus. And so that, that synergy and, and that uh, coming together with uh, those who have been experienced and have been here a while and the new members, I think, is what the country absolutely needs. And I think you see that. Uh, as uh, President-elect Obama put together his cabinet. He understands, you know, we, the vision is there. You know, we know where we need to go. We know, you know, we have to be creative, but you also must have people who have the experience to help us get there. And I think that I could say, uh, you know, you could see uh, with the Congressional Black Caucus. And so I don't believe that's a, a, cri a fair criticism when you look at, you know, how this works. Uh, it's not either or. It's both both and. Uh, and yes, there are a lot of high expectations. People have a lot of hope. I think what we saw the night of the election was a sigh of relief. People were <laughs> jubilant. They were, they had, they felt like they had their country back. And they're very hopeful. And, and President-elect Barack Obama has said that it's not going to be easy. It's going to take time. And I think what's important is that we keep people engaged in the process. Make sure that people know that that they must be petition their government, you know, for the changes that have to be made, that that's their duty and their right. 
and uh, for instance on health care reform. We're not going to pass anything on health care reform unless people are engaged in our country to do this. And so that hope and that energy and what we saw during the election must continue. And I think that's how uh, we're going to get the job done. But uh, it certainly is not going to be overnight and it's not going to be easy. Okay, get the gentleman here and then the gentleman over here. Uh, my name is uh, Femi Akimbi. I'm originally from Nigeria. I run a group here called the African Development Center. The focus is the infrastructure development of Africa. My question, ma'am, is there anything on the pipeline for CBC to do with Africa infrastructure or the economical development? Uh, for example, in the past month, the issue of global crisis in the economical aspect, or financial crisis, rather, Africa with a billion people strong were barely mentioned once. Yesterday at the Brooklyn Institute, two hours on the issue of the global finance issue, who were not even mentioned for two hours. Thank you. Thank you. And I think when you look at the history of the CBC, uh, recent and past, you'll see some of the strongest leaders uh, on Africa uh, in the CBC. Congressman Don Payne, Chairman Payne, chairs our Africa subcommittee. Uh, and Mr. Rangel uh, on all of the Africa Growth and Development Act. Uh, we've worked very di uh, diligently on the Millennium Challenge accounts, trying to make sure that infrastructure development issues are addressed in Africa from that account. But I think we have to rev it up. I mean, this is right now we don't have nothing, and we don't have anything new on the table, but uh, we will. And we have to look at uh, how we address trade and aid. Uh, in a very uh, comprehensive way. And also we've got to end the genocide in Darfur. And you, you'll, you've seen uh, CBC members taking the lead on uh, Darfur on, and on each and every uh, issue relating to Africa, whether it's HIV and AIDS, uh, development, uh, trade. But we definitely, uh, and I think now with President-elect Obama in the, in the White House, we'll see uh, Africa uh, raised you know, even as a, as a larger uh, priority in terms of a region. And the CBC will definitely continue our work uh, on the continent. Uh, my name is uh, Nureddin Sati. I, I am uh, a senior fellow at uh, Woodrow Wilson Center with the Africa program. I come from Sudan. And uh, Mr. Akimi's question and in answer to it has preempted a little bit what I was going to, to, answer, to ask. Uh, but my question, I would reformulate it in, in a different way. Um, Africa, of course, is, uh, is, a, is a continent that has been for some time, uh, I would say, neglected or in a way. But I appreciate what the Black Caucus has been doing, and uh, uh, Mr. Payne and the uh, Black Caucus de uh, delegation did visit Sudan and, and go to Darfur. Uh, and uh, I would like to commend you for that, and I would like also to commend your anti-war uh, position, having worked for peace in Africa for many years. I, I appreciate your, your position. Um, what uh, um, uh, President-elect Obama has made it very clear that he's going to have a new vision for peace in the world, peace and security in the world. And that war will not be the fairest option as it has been in the past. What would be the, the caucus's uh, role uh, and contribution to, the, to that vision, uh, to the formulation of the vision and the implementation of that vision? Uh, sure. And as I said earlier, you know, we're the, we're the Congress and we're the, the body that um, makes the laws. And uh, what we have to do is work with President-elect Obama to make sure that we write laws relating to Africa and funding initiatives that uh, make sense that he can sign into law and pass. And so it's going to involve much negotiation. And it's going to involve, and, and I'm very delighted with our new ambassador who was uh, with President Clinton in the Africa Bureau. Uh, and so I think that's going to be a big focus, and I think the CBC uh, will be very prominent in uh, the development of, of our policies and our funding priorities uh, with regard to the continent. We did submit a white paper to uh, the Barack Obama administration on, on Darfur and what we think needs to be done right away. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to work on some of those strategies too. I want to give our panelists a chance to uh, ask a question of Ms. Lee before she leaves. 
Um, sure. Uh, do you think the, how do I ask this? Do you believe, um, do you think Barack Obama will still withdraw troops from Iraq in 16 months? Well, as a co-founder of the Out of Iraq Caucus. <laughs> what, will you, what will you do if he doesn't, I guess, is what I should have, how I should have asked it. <laughs> we believe that he's definitely going to, to bring our young men and women home, as he said, has said, in a responsible and practical way. And there are many of us, myself, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, uh, Congresswoman Lynn Woolsey, and many members of the Congressional Black Caucus who uh, will work day and night to help him uh, develop a plan to, to bring our troops home. That's $10 billion a month. That's the other part of what hasn't been addressed uh, as much in terms of this economic downturn is the, the impact of, of the occupation of Iraq, uh, $10 billion a month, uh, what that means in terms of uh, jobs, in terms of health care, what it means in terms of our schools, what it means in terms of our infrastructure. And That's so a small we've got to deal with that. He's spoken uh -huh. in terms of combat troops throughout. Do you... What if we end up with 3,000 troops in a few years who are not combat troops? Are you committed to having zero troops for 20,000? Is there a number of troops you'd like to see, you know, two years from now beyond combat troops sort of leave some vagary, I would argue, in terms of how many troops can remain? So. Well, that, now I'm speaking as Congresswoman Barbara yes. Lee, not as chair of the Black Caucus, but I've been pushing, and, and actually the entire uh, Black Caucus and both Republicans and Democrats have supported my um, bill for no permanent military bases. Uh, and that bill called for bringing home uh, all of our uh, contractors and not having a permanent military presence in Iraq. And so that's, that's where many of us fall on that. Don, did you? Uh, Reggie, we've been joined by Reggie Weaver, former head of the NEA, so we haven't had any questions on education. So you want to say something about education before we close it out? <laughs> I really have appreciated working with the Congressional Black Caucus as well as the Foundation on issues that are important to America's children and America's public education. I have always found that the Congressional Black Caucus and the Foundation has been very, very supportive, whether it was with uh, modifying and, and, and making changes to No Child Left Behind, whether it was a dropout rate, whether it was closing the achievement gap, whether it was school funding. Uh, the Black Caucus has always been there. I know that uh, the uh, No Child Left Behind reauthorization uh, probably will be looked at once again, but I would ask that as you look at what needs to happen as it relates to public education, you look at not only No Child Left Behind. Like I mentioned to Senator Kennedy and, and um, um, uh, uh, Reed, I'm uh, not Reed, but uh, uh, George Miller, when reauthorization was taking place, um, we have to make sure that public education is discussed in a manner that gives people the, the, the impression that we are doing something. No Child Left Behind is a part of education. It is not the part of education. And if, in fact, parents don't see us talking about funding, dropout, class size, uh, uh, closing the gap, then they will they begin to believe that No Child Left Behind is the only thing that can happen as it relates to public education. Yeah. So I know that you all have um, uh, um, your plates full, but people talk about public education being important, but then again, the rhetoric is not matched by action. So hopefully as we move forward and we talk about those things that are important to kids, primarily kids that look like me, uh, then we will, you know, we will not uh, recognize that, we will recognize that one size does not fit all. Sure. Thank you very much. And I think you're absolutely right. And, and I have to, again, refer to members of the Congressional Black Caucus who serve on the Education and Labor Committee. Congressman Shaka Fatah, for example, he has a phenomenal bill that hopefully we can move that talks about all of the uh, issues and uh, the disparity, the moral gaps in education. So hopefully we can get that bill, uh, a hearing for that bill this year. And, and also uh, dropout rates. You know, again, you talk about this pipeline to prison. You know, until we address uh, dropout rates uh, in the African-American community and communities of color, we won't be able to crack that pipeline. And so I think in messaging and how we talk about it, you're right, we need to broaden it to talk about what, um, 
what education, po what an equitable education policy entails and what it means. And then I think we'll be able to make some progress. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Congresswoman, would you like to make some concluding remarks before we? Well, let me uh, say how happy I am to have been here with you today. This is actually my first public event since being elected chair. <laughs> so this was. <laughs> Such distinguished experts and scholars and activists, uh, you know, it's, it's been really uh, good for me. Uh, and I really thank you for this opportunity. I think the questions really help me understand where we need to go, you know, and, and I will definitely brief the Congressional Black Caucus on some of these issues and questions that came up today because I think this really does provide a, a good barometer. Of, of where uh, the country is and what we need to think about as, as CBC members. So thank you again very much, and thank you, Beth. Thank you, Congresswoman Lee. When we were looking at who to bring as a speaker, and I, I mentioned to Don, uh, Congresswoman Lee, I said, but of course, that's our first week on the job, so she, we may not be able to get her. So we thank her for taking time out of her busy schedule to join us today. Well, that was a wonderful keynote, and I think it really uh, sets things up nicely for the, the second half of our program. Uh, what I'd like to do is just briefly uh, introduce the, uh, the other panelists now so that I will not interrupt the flow of their uh, presentations. And uh, when, when each of them finishes, uh, or after they've all finished with their presentations, which will be about 10, 15 minutes each, uh, we'll maybe talk a little bit among the panel, and then we will open it up to you uh, on the floor for questions. Uh, I expect maybe go a little uh, past 5 o'clock since we started around 10 after 3. So uh, after that, though, there will be a reception to which you are all invited in the uh, atrium area just outside of this uh, room. Um, our first uh, presenter will be uh, Dr. Katrina Gamble, who is an assistant professor of, of political science at Brown University, and she will summarize an original uh, paper prepared for this seminar entitled Incorporation and Representation, Congressional Black Caucus Leadership in the Committee System. Uh, this has uh, been uh, handed out uh, to the participants both here and in our overflow uh, room upstairs, but it's also available uh, on our website, as is the introductory uh, essay, which I prepared. Um, she uh, has her, uh, I believe, her M MA and PhD from Emory University, is that correct? And uh, her mentor was uh, someone who has appeared here uh, previously, uh, Randall Strayan, who has uh, done some wonderful uh, work in the areas of uh, congressional leadership. So we're so uh, pleased to, to have uh, Dr. Katrina Gamble uh, with us. Uh, she will be followed by uh, George Dolly, who uh, is the chief of staff to uh, Representative Charles Rangel, who is also the chairman, as you know, of the uh, House Ways and Means Committee. Uh, George has had a very distinguished career in public service, including being a deputy assistant secretary of state in the Carter administration, a member of the Civil Aeronautics, Civil Aeronautics Board. Uh, he also served as a lawyer in private practice. Uh, he has both an MBA and a law degree from uh, Columbia. And uh, then we will hear finally, uh, I always have the journalists as sort of the, uh, what I would call the, the wrap-up speakers, uh, uh, because I think they have a good overview and a way of bringing uh, things together for us. And we're very pleased to have uh, uh, Perry Bacon with us, who is a staff writer with the Washington Post, previously served as a Washington correspondent uh, with Time Magazine, where at different times he covered politics, diplomacy, uh, and education. So uh, with that, let me turn it over to Katrina Gamble. You can, each of you can speak either from your places or use the podium. It's uh, your choice. Okay. <laughs> Well, first, I want to thank the Woodrow Wilson Center and also the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for um, sponsoring this event and um, to Don Wilsonberger for inviting me to do to participate in this. Um, it's, it's a great honor for me to be here and to participate in this discussion. Um, 
the the paper that I submitted for today's panel is kind of a larger project that I've been working on called Black Voice, Deliberation, Race um, in the U.S. Congress. Um, and so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is going to be focused in, in think, and really I'm going to be focusing on two of the questions that kind of Don um, laid out at the end of his essay, um, well, which I worded differently than him, the question of will success spoil the CBC. I worded it, how does the increase in corporation of black representatives in the House affect the CBC and its ability to work towards its goals? Um, and then the second question, how will the election of Barack Obama as president of the United States affect the workings of the Congressional Black Caucus? And in a lot of ways that I'm going to be th talking about, answering this question is going to focus on issues um, of political voice. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but first, in thinking about this first question um, about, you know, this, under, uh, this question about uh, how increase in corporation and the success of the CBC will affect its ability to reach its goals, I think there are some kind of, there are some under, obvious underlying assumptions, um, and that is that will black legislators be able to remain committed to advocating for the disadvantaged and marginalized groups as they become more a part of um, institution of Congress? Or do black legislators have to sacrifice certain policy goals um, for political ambition? Uh, this is certainly not a new question that has faced the Congressional Black Caucus. In fact, um, in the 1970s, Ron Dellums, who Congresswoman Lee spoke so highly of, Democrat from California, wrote in his biography that when he became chair of the, the District of Columbia Committee um, in the 70s, some wondered whether or not um, this would um, deter his ability to um, stay committed to issues of economic justice and other policies that he saw relevant to the African American community. And so there's always been this question for the Congressional Black Caucus, can one be an insider and continue to push for these type of what some call outsider interests or issues that typically um, are important to those who are the most politically marginalized uh, in our society. Um, to this second question about the impact of President Obama on, on the CBC, I think there are some several underlying points that I wanted to talk about very quickly. First is um, this question of does having a black president shift the kind of assumed leadership within the African American community away from the Congressional Black Caucus? particularly on kind of legislative policies or leadership within, um, within Washington. And in fact, on Meet the Press um, this past Sunday, there was some questions um, on a panel where Max, um, Congresswoman Maxine Waters was there about whether or not black Americans will continue to look to the Congressional Black Cau Caucus for leadership on, on certain legislative policies or will their roles be co-opted by um, President Obama. Um, and, to, and I'll address this a little bit more, but I, I tend to agree with Congress with Lee. I think that there is room for both. And I think that, um, that the Congressional Black Caucus' his role is, is very different than what we should expect from President-elect Ob President Obama. Um, and I'll explain why I, I think that in a minute. And then the other point, I think, to consider with this, this idea of how the election of Obama affects the Congressional Black Caucus is to consider the type of campaign that Obama ran and what that means for black politics more broadly. Um, there's been lots of discussions um, over the course of the last couple of years about post-racial politics um, and a kind of political science jargony term that's often used is deracialization of politics. Um, and what that means as kind of defined in political science, deracialization, is the practice of um, black politicians art articulating political demands in terms that are not racially specific, so that they appeal to a broader group of, um, of group of people, presumably those who may not, um, who may be may be alienated by the focus on the use of, of race in the dialogue. And so the question is, if, um, if we're moving to a political landscape where race is removed from the dialogue, what does that mean for the Congressional Black Caucus, whose purpose it is, um, to, a, to a large extent, is to represent a particular racial minority? Um, so to address these questions, like I said, I wanted to focus on this idea of political voice. Um, and a lot of my research has focused on uh, this idea that what uh, who legislators are has a lot to do um, what they, uh, with what they do, which seems 
um, pretty obvious, I think, to most people. But in most of the research uh, that's been done on issues of political representation, um, and also on Congressional Black Caucus and um, scholarship that is evaluate members, African American members in Congress, a lot of the research is focused on things like roll call votes and bill introductions. Um, and ideology and things like that, which are all very important. And so that is to say that typically scholars will look at African-American members of Congress and see, do they introduce bills, different, um, different types of bills than their white colleagues? Do they vote in a different way? Is their ideology dramatically different? Um, and what my research is focused on more is this idea that one of the biggest contributions that African-American legislators bring to the institution is their political voice. Um, and the idea behind that is that every legislator um, is influenced by a number of factors, right? Their constituent, um, constituent interests, their party, their own political ambitions, but of course, obviously, they're also their own kind of personal policy preferences. Um, and so the argument that I make is that as members of historically marginalized group, African-American legislators bring a unique pers perspective to the institution that would otherwise not be there if, if they weren't present. So this is not to say that all African-American members of Congress think the same. That's clearly um, not the case, but that there is some kind of shared history um, of being a part of this racial minority in the United States that I think um, shapes, uh, that, that off allows them to bring a different um, political perspective to congressional debates and discussions. So um, when, in some of the research that I've done in looking over kind of the course, the history of Congress, um, it's been pretty consistent whether or not African American members, even when they were small in size, um, you know, 13, or large in size, 42, when they were a part of the minority party as Democrats and currently a part of the majority party and holding um, committee leadership positions, um, that I think is one thing that has been cons consistent is that we have seen uh, the African American members of Congress um, tend to use their political voice in ways that um, benefit uh, African American constituents, or at least um, if the policy outcomes are not necessarily um, what they want, it, um, it uh, at least brings voice to issues that um, may not necessarily be, have been a part of the, the policy process. Um, and I wanted, just to kind of like draw out some examples of this, I wanted to give a few examples. Like, and the focus of the paper that I wrote was actually on the, the congressional committee system, but I pulled out a couple examples of how the Congressional Black Caucus has used its voice, I think, to advocate for African Americans in, in ways that extend beyond the, the committee system. Um, and so the first thing that I, I wanted to talk, the first example that I wanted to go over really quickly was um, the issue of Hurricane Katrina. So on September 2nd, uh, 2005, the Congressional Black Caucus held a, a press conference to address the suffering following Hurricane Katrina. Um, and there was a really important quote that Representative Elijah Cummings, Democrat of Maryland, offered at that time. And what he said was, many of those now in such dire circumstances were already living in poverty and, dis and destitution even before the hurricane came. They had no ability to evacuate, and now their very survival depends on the response of this country. Many of these Americans who are now struggling to survive are Americans of color. Their cries for assistance confront America with our moral compass as a nation. We cannot allow this to be said by history that the difference between those who lived and those who died in this great storm in 2005 was nothing more than poverty, age, or skin color. Um, and I give this example because um, pretty, like, there was, like, there was this lag in, in the media coverage of Hurricane Katrina where, I mean, obviously we saw, like, the images on the television, but in a lot of the media coverage there was almost, like, no mention of race um, and, like, how class and race intersected and what that meant for the different victims. And so it was interesting that the Congressional Black Caucus, in choosing to have this press conference, drew attention to how race and class intersected and how that also led to the disproportionate impact of African Americans um, as far as being victims of, of Hurricane Katrina. And so here's an example as far as like outside of the institution, the Congressional Black Caucus holding a press conference to draw attention to something that is like particularly relevant to African Americans, um, not only to the victims of Hurricane Katrina, but also polls showed that um, at, there was like serious disparities in how um, African Americans and white Americans viewed the response to Hurricane Katrina. So in articulating this issue of race, to some degree, they're bringing voice to some of the concerns of, of black constituents. Um, 
Okay. Um, the second example I wanted to give um, is uh, from January 2001. And this is not necessarily something that the Congressional Black Caucus as an organization did, but it's some of its members. Um, in, on January 6, 2001, Congress met in a joint session to certify uh, the Electoral College votes for the 2000 presidential um, election. And typically, this is you know pretty ceremonial procedures um, where Congress just um, certifies the votes for um, the electoral colleges and things move forward. Um, but on that day, a number, 10 of the CBC members um, objected to the certification of the 25 electoral votes from Florida. Um, and they argued that the votes were invalid because of a significant number of citizens, um, especially blacks, had been dis disenfranchised um, through the vote counts in Florida. Um, and actually at that time, uh, Congresswoman Brown of Florida stood on the House floor and said, quote, I stand for the purpose of objecting to the counting of the vote from the state of Florida as read. It is in writing and signed by several House colleagues on behalf of the 27,000 voters of Duval County, of which 16,000 of them are African Americans that were disenfranchised in this last election. Um, of course, uh, there, the, her objection had to be signed by a senator, so it, procedurally nothing went forward. But the point here is that here again, there was a moment like where many African Americans um, at the time during 2001 um, had issues with the voting irregularities in Florida, and there is a number of members of the Congressional Black Caucus used their leverage um, as, as black leaders and used their political voice um, to draw attention to this particular issue on the floor of the House. Um, all right. And then the last, the last example that I wanted to, to give actually has to do with um, the committee system. And this is actually um, ha uh, is some action that happened in the committee system when, the, when most members of, well, actually all members of the Congressional Black Caucus were a part of the minority party during the 107th Congress. And in some of the research that I've done, uh, you, would, you might expect that, they, that members of the Congressional Black Caucus were not very active because of limited power that they may have had as part of being a part of the minority party. But a lot of the research that I conducted actually found that when, uh, when members of the Congressional Black Caucus were a part of the minority party, they were still very active and engaged in the committee process. Um, and in fact, they were more likely, um, in some of the research I've done, more likely than their white colleagues to offer amendments and speak um, during committee markups on a, on a variety of different issues. Um, and so even though they, they had some, they had limited power as far as like the agenda of the committee um, and what came out of the committee, they used the committee session still to kind of speak to issues that they thought were relevant to their constituents and also relevant to um, issues that may be more important to African Americans African Americans um, and marginalized groups more generally. Um, and so the example that I, I, I give often when I talk about this actually has to do with the No Child Left Behind Act, and it was a committee markup meeting um, uh, on the Education and Workforce Committee. I think it was the Education and Workforce Committee that moment. It's, the name changes several times. Or the Education and Labor Committee. I can't remember during that Congress what it was called. Um, but the committee was meeting to mark up that particular um, bill. And there were basically like two frames that were kind of being used during that markup. And one was that the bill's purpose was to work towards um, closing um, the achievement gap um, within the education system um, between wealthy students and poor dis disadvantaged students. Um, and then the other frame that was focused on was uh, holding schools and school districts accountable for failure by connecting funding to school performance. And there was lots of discussion during that markup about um, issues with testing. And um, over the course of that markup, over the course of that markup, um, all of the all of the African American members, um, except for one on that committee, um, made arguments against testing, um, and they also all framed their discussions in terms of this bill's importance to close the achievement gap between disadvantaged students um, and and wealthier students. 
Um, and to that, and to that effort, like many of the Demo even many of the white Democrats on um, the Education Workforce Committee were also opposed to testing for a variety of reasons. Um, but the difference between them and the members of the Congressional Black Caucus that were on that committee is that uh, many of the white Democrats who opposed testing made arguments about um, funding, that there wouldn't be enough funding for states to implement the testing and things like that. And you had members like um, Representative Bobby Scott uh, and Donald Payne, and at that time, Representative Major Owens of New York, making arguments against testing for very different reasons. And they were making arguments against testings because they argued that they were often racially biased, that they could be used to track students. Um, they made arguments that test, these standardized tests were not necessarily good measures of a child's ability um, to be successful. Um, and in fact, during that committee markup meeting, um, Representative Bobby Scott offered an amendment to remove, um, that would bar the use of tests for high stakes decisions such as graduation to get promoted or to qualify for college track courses. Um, now ultimately the, the amendment didn't pass and as we all know the testing provisions um, remained uh, in, in that bill. But I always offer this as an example is because here we have um, Democrats on this committee both opposing testing, but the, the, Congress, the black members on that committee were opposing testing for different reasons. Um, and so by having those members on that committee, they were offering a di an additional perspective, expanding the, the scope of deliberation. Like one may not necessarily vote against testing because of funding issues, but if one argues that a test is racially biased or that it can be used to track students into um, remedial courses, then that may be something else. That may be a different way to persuade um, you know, other members of, you know, other members to support the particular policy. Um, so, so I just offer these as examples of like, even as, even when they, even when African American members are like constrained by like being a part of the minority party, they continue to use their voice in ways I think to influence issues that are relevant to African Americans. Um, and then I just briefly kind of looked at some of the hearings that John Conyers held in the last Congress. Um, and. So to, to Don's question about will you know, success spoil the CBC, I, I don't think so. I mean, because uh, Congressman Conyers, um, in reading some of his statements to some of the hearings he's, he held on the mortgage crisis, on issues dealing with gang, cri gang crimes, um, the disparities in sentencing for cocaine and crack cocaine, um, he and also housing discrimination and many of his statements he's drawn attention drawn attention to racial disparities on a number of those issues um, even as um, the chair of of that particular committee so that's just obviously one example and we won't use uh, Congressman Conyers as a universal litmus of um, the Congressional Black Caucus because he um, has a reputation of being uh, very, very liberal on a number of different issues. But he is uh, a clear example of, you know, even despite this leadership position, continue to kind of advocate for these issues. Um, just really quickly on that second question about the role of uh, President o Obama and how that's going to affect um, the Congressional Black Caucus. Um, to that question, I think that um, I, I think that the trend. I don't think that um, President Obama will co-opt um, the Congressional Black Caucus, and I think that um, the issues that uh, I think that the roles that the, the these that the Obama administration and the Congressional Black Caucus have to play in addressing issues that are important to the African American community um, and the poor and other marginalized groups are going to be different. Um, first, I mean, uh, Congresswoman Lee said this, uh, is that we can't expect, uh, I, I, she didn't say this exact thing, but we can't expect um, Obama to be seen as kind of the sole leader of the black community. And first, um, this is because President Obama is president of the United States, um, and he has to make p policy de decisions with a much broader perspective. And kind of given his focus and his campaign on this idea of one America and working um, with bipartisanship, it would obviously be very difficult for him to focus too much attention on on just like one particular community. Uh, so I think that black Americans will have to continue to and will continue to look to others for leadership on important policy areas. Um, and I think Obama's kind of will, you know, will offer broad policy recommendations that can benefit um, African Americans and other marginalized groups like for in his economic stimulus package. So 
you know, he can offer these large like issues on health care reform, economic policy, things like that, um, that generally will, you know, if it benefits, you know, everyone, I think Congressman Waters on Sunday said on Meet the Press, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats will help African Americans. But we can look to the CBC with their years of expertise um, in various policy areas to kind of write in the details. Um, that is to talk about specific programs that may be beneficial to African Americans or policy areas that they could work to incorporate in some of the some of the, the policies that um, that President Obama might offer that would benefit um, the African American community more broadly. So. Thank you very much. <clears throat> George Daly. I could uh, read what I had for about 10, 15 minutes, but I don't think I'm going to. Uh, Katrina has done a great job of basically making the case that the Congressional Black Caucus is relevant and will continue to be relevant. I want to spend just a couple of minutes to throw out some thoughts, hopefully to stimulate some questions and discussion as to why there is a general perception maybe that the Black Caucus has been less than it should be and might have all these kinds of dilemmas that Don and other scholars point out. And I think that it has to do, if I could pick one area, it's the press. It's our, and everybody, I guess, <laughs> I don't want to sound like Sarah Palin, wait a moment. <laughs> I, I want to basically say that we have a problem in that there's a difficult, and maybe this lagging perception will be fixed by Barack Obama becoming president, that black folks interested in civil rights, black folks interested in poverty, black folks interested in poor pe things that affect poor people. And if you want somebody on Sunday television to talk about issues like um, the national defense or national economic policy or foreign policy in the Middle East or any other issue that matters because it's large, you don't have a black person come on to do that because you know that's not what we do. But we do it. And until there is a perception in the people who run the media that a John Conyers is chairman of the Judiciary Committee and should come on and talk about Guantanamo and, and the issues of torture and all of the ones that fall within the jurisdiction of that committee, um, that we're not going to be able to appreciate a John Conyers. Charlie Rangel gets more than a share of television. No, let me not say more than a share. He would never say that. But enough television. <laughs> He's visible. But you don't see Betty Thompson, who has a lot to offer as chairman of the Homeland Security Committee. You don't see a lot of our talented people who should be on television regularly and not uh, be marginalized to the traditional issues. Once that becomes recognized, I think it'll be much better off. I start with that because I have friends, too. He, for a moment, forget that I've worked for the Black Hawkers off and on for about 30 years. Um, she was really an intern when we started. I was an older person. I was already a staff person. Um, I look forward to Barbara Lee's leadership, by the way, and I'm happy you had a chance to hear her. Barbara's a wonderful person. She was a great staffer. She was a great assemblywoman, did groundbreaking work in terms of ties between California and uh, Africa in particular, but all over uh, Asia and the rest of it. And the fact that she has a perspective of having done work on the Hill as a staffer and now as a member after the in-between state experience will make her extraordinary in terms of her judgments, and I look forward to seeing her leadership. It will be great. On, um, stay, let me stay with Meet the Press. The best thing about Sunday was that Maxine Waters was not talking like the Maxine Waters of old about um, we're going to rise up or we, we've got to demand our justice. We've got to, uh, we've, we as a community are going to have to have our place in the sun. She was talking about a trillion-dollar bailout package. And when she talked about it, she was speaking as a member of the finance uh, of, of the, uh, the committee that's going to determine where a lot of that money goes, particularly as it goes into communities for housing and for infrastructure development and so on. She was speaking about the substance of it in a way that was very clearly uh, in the province of somebody who knows what she's talking about and talking about it in, in a national vein. That can happen over and over again, and I hope that those of you who are in the habit of writing or know media people, um, we can see maybe that having become accustomed to having, well, we're not accustomed yet, but ultimately maybe black leadership won't be, we certainly have a pres president now that's broken through that. We need breakthroughs also in terms of the consciousness and the uh, understanding of uh, what Black Caucus does. Of course we're going to be better off with Obama as president. I, I like the questions because questions lead to 
thinking of things outside the box. But I've worked with Charlie since 2001 when I came back when we were still in the minority. And the last, we thought in 2006 we'd achieved our liberation and we're really happy. And then for the last two years, we have, in the House, despite the efforts to get out things like S-CHIP and to defeat, back the, to defeat the privatization of Social Security and, and the rest of it, we've come up against a Senate that has different rules and basically requires a majority that is 60 percent or more in order to be able to get anything done. And we had the presidential veto. So we, got, we get stopped in the House by the presidential veto way before we even pass anything. There was, at least people can basically take a position they're not going to go in our direction because it's not going to happen at any rate. The fact that we have a president who's not going to veto progressive legislation will make all the difference in the world and will allow our ideas and our, uh, and our agenda to flourish. So it's going to be a happy relationship. I agree with Katrina and Barbara, everybody, and I think everyone should see that the president needs our advocacy now more than ever. He is president of the United States. The way it works generally is the president responds to the voices of the American people and hopes to come up with the place where the people really are, either through consensus or through some a melding of the wishes of the American people and the, and the raising of the issues that are most pertinent to the people. The voice of the Black Caucus continues, it will have to be a very consistent voice for progressive government. We have a situation in this country which is intolerable in terms of the amount of suffering. The millions of people who are without health insurance and therefore coming sick and dying because they're afraid to see a doctor and afraid of what's going to happen to them when they get older. The lack of income security for, the older, um, for their elder years. The numbers of people in substandard housing are faced with shelters. The, looming crisis for so many millions of people, disproportionately people of color in this country, at a time when this country can, could have and can still do so much better, is about as great a challenge as one could imagine. The economic crisis is scary, and no one can say anything. It's hard to say it. it's positive, but in a, in a way it may very well be, because it has freed us to look at the realities of this country in a way that we should have been looking at them all along. Not as a competition between ideology, but in an imperative of having to do something to essentially help people and to get resources in the hands of people so that we can have some kind of economic stimulus and recovery. I think that's very good for a new president because, especially a new president wants to be proactive because I think that we will have a situation in Congress where we'll be much more receptive to it. But Essentially, I, I thought I'd just put those thoughts on the table and hopefully listen to questions and um, discussions. I, I just want to say I had two examples I wrote down that I have to give uh, based on the work of Professor Gamble, and that's committee work. I remember that uh, Mr. Rangel was a conferee on the agriculture uh, bill last year, and it was a difficult and complex bill and finally got through. And, after, and during that process... He was able to, get, able to get past a stalled bill to provide greater uh, trade uh, and trade and commercial benefits to Haiti, which is one of the areas of, country, uh, of the world that Charlie's always been uh, very passionate about, an extension of the Caribbean Basin Initiative. Uh, when you're a committee chair, you can do things in rooms that, before, that you were never in before. And now members of Black Caucus are in rooms where they're going to help frame legislation in a way that's going to be stronger in its impact on the poorest of the poor. We're not ashamed of the word poor in the Black Caucus. We'll play the Democratic Party's uh, tactical game of middle class. We, because we're all Americans, we're all optimistic, we all probably believe we're middle class anyway. <laughs> but there are a lot of poor people who need help. And that's what the caucus will be saying in those rooms. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> One thing that I did not include in uh, George's uh, brief biography that you have in your handouts is the fact that he has also served over the last uh, eight or years or so as the chief uh, of staff of the uh, Congressional Caucus on uh, African uh, Trade and Investment, I believe. 
And uh, if you look in the back of the handout, uh, you'll see the large number of caucuses that there are. Uh, and these are informal member organizations. This is like maybe a club that you would have in, in high school that you went to and, and participated in. But uh, some of these are very active, some are less active, but they, uh, many of them do play a very uh, vital role in the legislative process outside the formal uh, committee memberships. And uh, these caucuses go across committee lines in order to draw members in that might have an interest in these areas. So I suspect that there was a lot of parallel work done between that caucus and the Congressional Black Caucus in, in promoting uh, more uh, aid and trade uh, with Africa. Let's, yes. yeah. Let's go uh, at this time the cleanup hitter uh, from the Washington Post, uh, Perry Bacon. All right. Um, just a little bit about myself. I cover Congress for the Post now, and I covered the 2008 campaign with Hillary Clinton and Obama as, as well. Um, I guess the first thing, there was, a, there was something in Don's essay about uh, relevance. And to me, this is sort of a pretty simple question. Um, uh, if, if Hillary Clinton would have won the White House, I don't think we would anyone would Emily's list still have existed? I would suggest to submit yes, Emily's list would still exist because, you know, even though Hillary Clinton had won the election, Emily's list, the group that sort of works to elect women to Congress, would still say there are, you know, 20 senators who are women and there are most of the people in the country are, are women. So I think that that's an obvious answer to the relevance question. Also, I would think in terms of Obama's president now, the odds I would suggest are the next president probably won't be black. And, you know, the odds are also the next president may be a Republican. So I think the caucus will, you know, will not close its doors for those two reasons alone. Um, I think it will be different in the Obama context. Um, I think uh, George talked about the committees being so important. And I think it will be interesting to watch. Um, you know, that's, the mo that's one of the more important interactions between Obama and his staff and the committees. Charlie Rangel Will be very will be very involved in the, the, the stimulus plan, which is going to spend eight hundred billion dollars. And members of Congress will have different differences about how to spend that money versus uh, Obama in some instances, I guess. And I'm interested to see you know sort of how that works. Um, John Connors, we mentioned already, will be interesting because if you watched Obama's interview yesterday, he seemed to say, "I don't want to look back at the past in terms of what Bush did. I want to look forward. I don't want to investigate too much of what happened before." John Connors has been very much like, "I want to look into everything Bush did." And so I'm very curious to see if Obama's staff at some point says, "You know, please, you know, let's." move forward. Let's look back. Um, and Ed Towns is in, is in charge of the uh, Oversight Committee in Congress. And it'll be very interesting as well because I don't know how excited Obama's team will be if they make, make a mistake in Towns. So there's lots of hearings about it, but the Republicans are going to push him to do that. I mean, Obama will make mistakes at some point. It'll be interesting to see what, how Congress investigates that. And that'll be something Ed Towns is very involved in. Um, and on sort of issues, you know, that, that the caucus is involving sort of sort of race on some level, um, I think what, what Barbara Lee laid out, I think the, the, the initiatives Barbara Lee laid out, I think Obama would agree with everything she said. I think the questions are going to be about, to some extent, about sort of what are his priorities? What are the things he sort of puts at the forefront? I don't think he's mentioned Darfur recently, as far as I've heard. So that's a question I wonder if, you know, how will caucus members deal with issues where he has not made them a priority and they'd like him to be rather than number 12 on his list, they'd like to see the number three on his list. Like if you remember the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, you would, like if I remember the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, I would, you know, wonder why Obama has not mentioned immigration reform in the last, since September, as far as I can tell. And I would think that maybe that suggests he's probably not going to make a priority for them, a priority for him. So that's something I think will be interesting to watch. I'll be curious, and maybe George won't like me saying this, I'll be curious to see how Obama reacts. There's been the House and the House Ethics Committee has been looking into uh, Congressman Rangel some, and I'll be curious to see what they say and then how Obama sort of discusses that or doesn't discuss that. I'm sure he'll say, you know, it's a congressional thing and I'm not involved in that. But in reality, you know, he'll be asked about that kind of question. I'll be curious to see what he does on that issue. Um, and I guess the last thing I wanted to sort of mention, I don't want to speak too long, is about um, I, th I thought the Burroughs situation is sort of apropos of nothing. It's so unique, you know, an indicted governor trying to sell a sentence. It's not a very relevant thing to most things in what we're talking about. But I thought two, two interesting things came out of it. Uh, the first one was I was, I was asked the day after Burroughs got picked, you know, Blagojevich clearly tried to, you know, wanted to have a put a trap out of sorts, you know, block this guy and we'll call you, you know, people will call you racist essentially. So that's what the, it was a little trap out there. And I, so I called, I was curious, you know, it was a, it was a Wednesday, it was a day before Thanksgiving. So I didn't have to use who I had in my phone list, you know, that day. There aren't a lot of congressional members who give reporters their cell phone numbers. So I had to use what I had. So I called Reverend Sharpton to ask him, you know, so what do you think about what's going on here? And the funniest thing happened. He said, you know, I asked him, so do you think Burr should be seated? And he said, I don't really have a comment on that. And I said, I sort of paused. Al Sharpton has never said no comment in his life, as far as I could tell. So then he stopped and he said, you know, I want to call the people in Chicago. And the reason is I don't, you know, I don't want to go out there and 
take a different position than the president-elect has. The president-elect has taken a position, and we feel like we should think about what he said first and be very cautious about that. And that sort of told me that, you know, a lot of African-American leaders and activists and that kind of thing are going to, it's going to be different to see how they disagree with Obama. I think that Jesse Jackson and Tavis Smiley, Tavis Smiley found disagreeing with Obama in public was often not, you know, their, break, their greatest move for their careers. So I'll be curious to see, you know, if a, if a CBC member has a very strong objection to Obama, something Obama did, which is not going to happen very often, but I'll be curious to see how they reacted that. And then the final thought I had was about uh, Congressman Lee mentioned this letter the CBC sent, sent about the Burroughs situation. Um, Archer Davis, who is running for governor uh, in Alabama, actually, you know, did, you know, uh, after the day after the letter was sent, he did an interview with his papers in Alabama. Um, he's about to run, announce running for governor next month, I guess. And he did an interview in which he said, I walked out of the meeting before that part of the vote, and I disagree with what they did. I don't think that was the right thing to do. Um, I think that we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't view this in racial terms, and therefore I didn't support, I didn't support the initiative. Which, and, you know, his move tells me he's looking for, you know, how to win the election perhaps, and he's thinking about that for the future. But it also tells me, it also sort of suggests that maybe, uh, the CBC has often been led by members who are sort of, you know, from uh, who are sort of Barbara Lee is more to the left than you know most members of Congress are. And I'll be curious to see as the CBC has more members who are thinking about statewide runs, whether it's Jesse Jackson Jr., whether it's Kendrick Meek, whether it's Archer Davis, how they how those members, if they at all change the dynamics of the caucus or how it behaves and what they might how they might think about if you're preparing for a statewide run, do you is one of your moves initially to distance yourself from the congressional black caucus as it appears Davis did. So that's something this that came out of the Burris situation that's not related to that directly. Just on my BlackBerry, by the way, Burris is going to be Harry Reid and uh, Durbin have uh, sort of given up the opposition and they're going to seat Burris this week, it sounds like. So those are my thoughts. Very good. Thank you. <clears throat> Do any of the uh, panelists have a follow up comment on anything others have said? Uh, Katrina? By the way, Katrina, you actually wrote an article about Katrina, the hurricane, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm working on a I'm paper right. that's been submitted. It's not published yet, but, okay. yeah, I have. <laughs> Anybody want to, any follow-up comments on what's been said by the others? Let me, just, let me defend my brother and George and say <laughs> there are 435 members of Congress. We don't interview many of them, so right. we talk to Wrangle a lot, you know. Yeah, but I understand your point, yeah, yes. about the media tends to go to members only for particular racial issues. I think that's true, yeah. Uh, I want to make sure. a comment. I, I appreciate the comments of the panel up here about race and the new president, because ever since you know it came, it became clear that Obama probably was going to win. Many of us have been questioned about, you know, is the Congressional Black Caucus relevant? You know, is this post-racial? Are we going to see the end of it? And uh, and so I'm really happy to to that we are addressing this, you know, because. Uh, you know, as, as, as one of the panelists said, you know, you don't go and ask other people, you know, that if Hillary Clinton had, had been elected, would this question still be out there? And uh, this whole thing of the Congressional Black Caucus is why they are constantly talking about black issues. That's the reason why they're called Black Caucus, because <laughs> they are there because other people were not addressing those particular issues. You know, I just think back when I, I went to undergraduate school at a black college, and so when I was at that black college, I did research papers that had nothing to do with being black because I was free to do that when I was at a black college. I could be free to write on whatever I wanted to write on. But then when I went to graduate school at a predominantly white school, then they, these issues you know, were not being addressed. So then I felt like I had to become a specialist on black issues just because you know, nobody else was addressing them. So I think you know, when you start looking at the priorities and why black people become labeled as experts on issues such as poverty and so forth is because if we don't do it, nobody else will. And I think that's how the, uh, the Black Caucus looked at it. But they also, you know, like Maxine and others, they serve on committees that don't necessarily focus entirely on these issues. So they do have expertise in these, in these other areas, but often they are never called upon to speak on those areas. But I think as we expand, as the caucus expands, as we get more people on the caucus, as they get more power, I think that people will come to see that caucus members do have expertise in a lot of different areas. And I think this is one of the, uh, the good things that's coming out of all this. I was talking with Congressman, former Congressman Bill Gray, 
and he was saying that you all have been misrepresenting this whole thing. Last year, the 110th Congress, we said unprecedented power. And he oh, said, really? but you stopped with talking about five chairpersons of full committees. He said, we have had five chairpersons of full <laughs> committees before. We've had a black majority whip before. He said, the difference is the committees that the African Americans are chairing you know, Ways and men, Means has often been considered the most powerful committee. Judiciary, these are powerful committees. We look back, there's a picture on the wall at our office, and it has the, uh, the chairpersons from the old era, but you had the district, District of Columbia, there used to be a committee called the District of Columbia Committee. I think it was a post office committee. So these were committees that were not as important in the full range of things as, as the members now. And he said the other very important factor is that they had no backup to those uh, Congressional Black Caucus members. You did not have subcommittee chairs who were African American. And last, last Congress, the 110 Congress, you had 17, or 18, you count Ms. Obama, you had 18 chairs of subcommittees. And he said that's what made them so powerful. It was the type of committees they were chairing as well as the subcommittees. Mm -hmm. Very good points. In fact, Bill Gray would know because he was both the uh, Democratic whip and the uh, Chair, chairman of the Budget Committee in the House, so uh, one of the very outstanding leaders at the time. I reflected when uh, Barbara Lee was talking about Shirley Chisholm and what an inspiration she was. Uh, she omitted the fact that uh, Shirley Chisholm was uh, one of the first blacks, if not the first black, to come on the House Rules Committee, which was a very powerful committee, and I was on the, the minority staff of that committee, and there were a, a couple times when Shirley Chisholm would vote against her own Democratic majority on the Rules Committee and with Republicans on something because she felt the minority, the partisan minority, was being treated unfairly. And so one of her colleagues looked at her and said, uh, why did you vote that way? She says, well, sometimes you've got to do what you've got to do. And, uh, <laughs> and she stood up and, and occasionally would vote with the minority party on procedural issues in that, that committee. With that, let's uh, open up the uh, floor to uh, questions. Uh, we've got probably a, another uh, 10 or 15 minutes, depending on how many questions there are. So let's bring the microphone first up uh, here, Susan. Okay, thank you. My name is Lawrence Halls, and I'm from uh, Gazin, Alabama, Palm Springs, Muncie, Indiana. A <laughs> little louder, please. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, the, the question really was, uh, the young lady kind of posed it about old school and new school, and I thought Ms. Lee um, uh, answered it well. But the thing that I thought was missing is that at this historic moment, what, what African Americans haven't had in this country was, in fact, control of resources. You know, the United States was a venture capitalist venture kings and queens and all the rest. Does anybody believe that Mr. Obama will be supporting in a shift of control to some resources? Who wants yeah. to take a stab at that? It's, uh... <laughs> Let me say something about old school and new school first. Um, first, I, I, it's a great it was a good question and a great answer. Um, we welcome, there needs to be the new school because what is emerging is a new generation of people, people like Arthur Davis who can think about running for governor of Alabama. That's unthinkable in the days when we started in politics and that's the progression we want to continue to have. So there's no dichotomy and there's no, there may be tensions, of course there are, there are different styles, there are people who sometimes make some of us feel maybe they don't really fully appreciate how they got there, but that's, that can be done within the family. That can always be talked about. What we all celebrate is that success. Now, in terms of redistributing the resources, no, I don't. I think that's b giving Mr. Obama too big a burden. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you look at it in a sort of the narrow perspective of what Congress can do in this economic rescue plan. The, the utter failure of what we used to think of the great free market capitalist system in this country um, implosion of it does open up opportunities. But I don't know how great those opportunities are because we really don't know any other system. I'm not sure we can have any radical departures. And I don't know whether Larry Summer and Robert Rubin is that much different from other people we've had before. Maybe they're going to do it a little bit better. 
but we're not going to what we need first before we start thinking about redistributing resources although not we can think about anything we want but the shorter term goal one that's more realistic is can we bring about some economic security can we rebuild the social safety net i think there's a moral imperative that first faces us as and that's, and that's the beginning of the road maybe to better but we really have more people of color in danger of falling further in, uh, and, and without the safety net into poverty than we have prospects right now of moving immediately up. So I think that as we, as Charlie Rangel talks about it now, he's thinking about the most um, need, the need to funnel whatever resources are made available to rebuild the social safety net. And then hopefully as we move to the second term, we can start thinking about what kinds of plans. So maybe that will be more feasible than it is right now, in, in my view, anyway. I think Mr. Rangel has also talked about uh, putting more of the resources where the greatest needs are. And so in the inner city, for instance, if you're going to create four, four million new jobs in America, how much emphasis is there going to be to try and bring more of those jobs into the inner cities? And I, I just don't know if that's possible when you're addressing it in this kind of an omnibus bill, whether we're going to restructure you know, job training programs and everything else to because you're creating new jobs in environmental areas, for instance, and, and a lot of this is going to require some training, I think, to, to get people into those jobs. But Well, I was actually just going to comment really quickly on the question about the old school versus new school. Um, and I agree with uh, the comments that have already been made, but I just wanted to, um, I think, kind of, I, to some degree, I think, clarify, because in the, my idea of thinking about the old school versus the new school is, I mean, I think the questioner, when she asked the question, talked about the old school members of the Congressional Black Caucus fo focusing on civil rights and new school, and Obama focusing on economic issues, and the Congressional Black Caucus has always um, been concerned with issues of economic um, justice and equality. Um, I think the difference is, is how it's framed, um, and Obama talks about economic issues, I think, in using language that doesn't necessarily um, use race or um, blacks in discussion of, of, of that. He talks about it in a much broader way, and maybe some of the old school members of the Congressional Black Caucus um, might place more emphasis on that. But uh, So I think that when we think about um, the differences of how people may go about dealing with these issues, I think a lot of it is going to have to do with how these issues are framed and discussed, um, and not necessarily um, differences in uh, what the policy priorities are or um, what issues are, 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 are important, but more like how they're framed and the strategies used to address those issues. Martin Luther King's last big march in Washington was a march right. for jobs. I mean, yeah, that's what it was absolutely. all about. Yeah, so. mm. Back here. Dropping everything. Uh, good afternoon. And um, my name is Joe Wynn. I'm with the National Association for Black Veterans. Uh, we're headquartered in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and uh, I'm stationed here in the D.C. area. First of all, let me say thank you to uh, the uh, panel for your service to the Congressional Black Caucus and to our community. Really appreciate your efforts. Um, just uh, wanted to make a couple of quick comments, if, if I could. One is um, the relevancy with regard to the relevancy of the Congressional Black Caucus. Um, that's almost like now we're starting to get the feeling that because Barack Obama is, is going to be president, we don't need an affirmative action program anymore. I don't agree with that. Uh, there's still going to be a need and an effort to be made for blacks and minorities and other disadvantaged persons to be able to fully engage and participate in this system in America. Uh, as a matter of fact, I kind of think that the Congressional Black Caucus now is going to be viewed more so than it ever has been before. Um, I'm already getting questions myself uh, with regard to other organizations who now all of a sudden have more of an interest in our black veterans program. Before, uh, we wasn't getting some of those calls. Now all of a sudden, there's a curiosity about what do we think? What are we dealing with? So the same now presents an opportunity for the Congressional Black Caucus and its membership and those who are working with that uh, organization to begin to present views not solely about uh, what's going on with the black community, but now you can express a view as to what you see should be happening with America. 
And that's where I live is in America. I don't just live in a black neighborhood. I live in America. The other thing I want to mention, too, is the Congressional Black Caucus members, as well as other members in Congress, I really feel need to start to begin to become more accountable and to begin to be more diligent about the responses that they provide to our community and particularly to this new president. With all this thing going on right now and the economic crisis and the bailout, we've already found that since Congress approved the $700 billion bailout, there's complications with that, there's loopholes in that, there was a rush to judgment to vote, yes, let's do it, and now we're finding that the homework was not done properly. Now we're talking about another $800 billion bailout, and somebody's talking about $600 going to a family, $1,200 to a family or two. What am I going to do with that $600 to pay my, my, my mortgage and, and, and get out of the, the debt that has accumulated? What about um, looking at some programs that will be realistic, not just for black and minorities, but for people within the community that will really help us get out, like some deductions. I think um, uh, Congresswoman Lee mentioned uh, moratorium on foreclosures. Let's look at some realistic programs, and let's also, and I'll conclude with this in my comment, um, elevate the level of awareness about our veterans. Veterans are men, women, young and old, you want to end the war. Obama has supported ending the war, pulling the troops out. They are your veterans when they get back home and they need some support. So let's, let's add them to the agenda. Uh, thank you. Very good. Any, any comments on that? I think well said. Let's bring it up here uh, if we could. Yes, uh, my name is Mark Batson. I'm uh, from Cleveland, Ohio, and um, I wanted to know the the uh, status if anyone had uh, any information on discussions regarding um, including um, citizens in the urban core in the work that's going to come about from the stimulus package. Um, it does seem as if those individuals could become a significant multiplier effect uh, from an economic standpoint to uh, create a, 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 a significantly higher uh, economic base within the community and within local municipalities so then other uh, infrastructure projects uh, can be uh, undertaken. You know, it, it would really be a shame, you know, many of us uh, ride through communities and do not see people that look like us working on projects in our core neighborhoods. And uh, uh, it, we, we really need to see that uh, the investment that those citizens have made in, in the change process is, is, is uh, reciprocated by getting the opportunity to participate. Charlie Rangel is very much involved in advocating that the money be uh, spent, as Dr. Scott has said, in the inner cities. Um, the problem is change is hard to, we'll see, change is needed because we have existing congressional structure. We have something called revenue sharing, and that goes through governors. We have, uh, and when it goes through states, it's been proven over the years that the inner city doesn't get, the governor has a responsibility to sort of be even-handed throughout the state. The inner cities need it more but don't get it because the state government usually makes that decision. Um, over st the folks who head the appropriations committees that deal with these infrastructure are used to doing business in their own accustomed way. And it's sort of hard to convince the chairman of the appropriation uh, of the transportation appropriations committee to say, not only do we want to, you to get this money out there as effectively as possible, we want you to do it in a totally brand new way. He's going to say, wait a minute, if you want me to do it fast, we better use the structures that we've built up over these years to get this money out. And over and over again, we're going to have an internal uh, congressional debate over not only how much should go where, but how does one make certain that it goes where we want it? Yeah, when they had the last stimulus bill, the, you remember the, the mantra was timely, targeted, and temporary. Well, sometimes targeted and timely run up against each other. They're not necessarily all in sync. Uh, we'd like to see some things more targeted, but it might take longer, and therefore they're not timely. But, uh, you know, who knows what the details much, are going to be. Yes, sir. Much of the discussion, and rightfully so, has focused on domestic issues. The election of Barack Obama had a, world, a worldwide impact. 
What advice would you give to the Congressional Black Caucus to help President Obama um, implement a successful foreign policy? That's above my pay grade. Who wants to tackle it? <laughs> well, we're thinking a lot about that. Uh, first, go for it. His, um, his insistence that we don't have to be afraid to negotiate and to talk to people is correct. And it was a shame that there were some people who felt that was a mistake. But it, it would be stupid to think so. We need to, as we can afford, we're a country great enough to be able to communicate with anybody if it means a road to peace. The idea that we're declaring people to be enemies and beyond the pale for discussion is not the way to bring about any kind of international agreement. So his major message is relevant to Gaza, is relevant to, to Iran, and it needs to be pursued. And that's the way the Black Caucus almost universally feels, and we're going to be very supportive of it. The rest of it is we're going to help, try to help him, because I think he's going to want to do it, having his wonderful background of being the son of a Kenyan um, uh, father, is maybe the, the United States can discover the rest of the world. Maybe the, we don't have to be fixated only on one area of the world. There may very well be a great, exciting opportunity out there for us to make better lives for people. Maybe peace can come through people having more hope for the future and having some kind of better economic prospect. Uh, there could be a different way to look at foreign policy than we've been doing it. And if that, if we could, if the black, we collectively as members of the Black Caucus, who have always been more interested in Africa, interested in the Caribbean, interested in Latin America, interested in the use of United States power and resources to bring about a world in which people have a better chance to aspire for the kind of life uh, that, that would make them really have a stake in the future, then that would be a worthy goal. And I think that's one of the things that we're more excited about working with the Obama administration. Okay, one we, have to, we have a new Secretary of State that needs to be a little more convinced about negotiation, <laughs> but perhaps we can get there. <laughs> Susan, one final question to your immediate left there. And then uh, the other questions we'll take outside at the reception. We'll continue our, our dialogue, I promise. Yes, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Akunle Jofetimi. I'm from the Executive Intelligence Review. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, when Obama was running for president, uh, there was a lot of uh, change. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yeah, that's good. Change is good. But what I was just trying to emphasize here is that uh, sometimes in history, changes do take some kind of uh, radical phase shift in thinking. For example, um, I was wondering on, on the panelists right now is that um, not only is the incoming Obama administration, but also members of Congress and also the American people and the world at large. Because right now, there's no denying the fact that we are facing a global financial disintegration. Now, on that, Thinking outside the box, like Mr. Daly was saying, is required, and it really is required. Nothing to be true. And the thing is this, is that number one, uh, what is going to be facing this incoming Obama administration and the Congress is that we have to have a reinvestment in the physical economy of our nation. Because right now, there's all this bailouts, trade money at something right now. It's not really going to solve the problem. But a reorientation, a radical phase shift from the free market enterprise to, this, to the system of American political economy. That is fair trade, not based on free trade. And then secondly, on the international front, uh, in order to get out of this international global crisis, we have to elevate the thinking of our people in the ghettos, in the communities. This is the work in which most of our community organizers have to do. And the President of the United States, Obama, which he will likely do, is that if he's willing, because if we're going to solve this global international crisis, we have to have number one, I don't know if you remember, a great president also said uh, there's nothing much to fear but fear itself, FDR. He appointed Ferdinand uh, Pecora, who investigated the abuse on Wall Street. And then secondly, which I was, is, is uh, an adjunction to what I was saying, is that uh, is the incoming Obama administration be willing to set up an, a new international monetary system with the United States, Russia, China, and India to have a new Bretton Woods? Because if we don't have a viable international free, uh, fair trade system, there's no way we're going to be able to solve our domestic problems and also foreign policy uh, issues and domestic issues around the world. So I wanted to see if any of the panelists have anything to say about that. Thanks. Uh, I would say I'm not expecting sort of you know paradigm shifting changes. I think you know we, we wouldn't have picked Larry Summers or Hillary Clinton or 
the 90 other people who worked for, for the first Clinton administration who are now uh, rejoining. It sounds more like, you know, I mean, change can be defined differently. I don't think it's, I mean, he's been pretty clear that change will be more sort of like liberal change from a very, from a conservative administration, more, you know, I think he would argue more effective change from a, what we would, some people would argue is a ineffective administration. But I'm not, I don't sense like, you know, over, and I think the, there will be attempts to rebuild the safety net, I think, you know, attempts to sort of create something that looks like the, the sort of the second New Deal or something that affect, but, but sort of radical shifts in policy I'm not expecting. Can I? Uh, uh, just, Can we, just, all right, um, real quick. Uh, okay, because what I was asking, and, and, and uh, Mr. Daly responded to, and you responded to, it goes back to the simple question. I believe that what we're witnessing at this historic moment is, in fact, a radical shift that we didn't create. The wolves on Wall Street created it in the destruction of Wall Street as we know it. Every time I look on TV, I hear Kramer and other people saying that what was up there on Wall Street doesn't exist anymore. So we're saying that we can't create a radical change when in fact it may have occurred, and the question really is, is can we respond to the opportunity that history has created, or greed created, or whoever created it? <laughs> Divine intervention is what I heard. <laughs> so otherwise, the young man is absolutely correct. <coughs> Tinkering around the edges will not solve the problem because it is global. And there are new sets of relationships that have to occur. In that process, the African American may have a chance, if it is grasped, to articulate a greater access to the resources to have long-term meaningful input into this society. I could not have summarized today's discussion better, <laughs> and I want to join, please join me in thanking our panel.